Inspired by the paper written by Dr. Kiranjit Singh, I'd like to now discuss an interesting concept, and that is of ovalizing the rexes in patients with a posterior polar cataract. Now, here's what I think are the merits of creating an oval rexes. One, you're able to very easily impale into the nucleus with the phaco probe and elevate it out of the bag. Two, the removal of the epinucleus will also be made much easier. Whether or not you're trying to impale into the epinucleus in the aspiration mode of the phaco probe and bring it out, or perform a viscodissection to prolapse it into the center. An oval rexus will allow reduction in the overall pressure exerted on the posterior pole should you plan to perform this maneuver. Third, the removal of the cortex, which anyway has been undisturbed because of the lack of hydrodissection, is also removed in an easier manner. And finally, should you need to place the IOL horizontally in the sulcus should you have an interrupted PCR, it's very comfortable to do so. The horizontal diameter of the rexis is really quite small and will allow for a safe placement of a three-piece IOL at 180 degrees. Let's now move to watching the surgery. This is a patient with a posterior polar cataract with a grade one nucleosclerosis. Like any other phaco emulsification and most certainly in a patient undergoing a posterior polar cataract surgery, meticulous care and attention to detail must be taken while making the incisions. I like to stain the anterior capsule with blue dye because it aids visibility while performing your capsular rexes. Following this, some viscoelastic is introduced into the anterior chamber to flatten the anterior capsule. After which, we use a well-fashioned cystotome introduced into the anterior chamber and proceed to create the rexes. Let's now see the creation of the oval rexes. What's important is that we maintain the horizontal diameter of this rexus slightly smaller. As mentioned earlier, that would allow for the placement of a three-piece lens horizontally if required. The vertical diameter, however, can be a little longer. Long enough to allow for ease of manipulations interoperatively, but short enough to allow for a cover of the optic edge on either side. Let's now watch the rest of the surgery and understand what are the merits of actually having an oval rexus. Let's start with the hydrodelineation. Some excess viscoelastic is removed from the anterior chamber. The hydrodissection cannula then impales into the depth of the nucleus and a jet of fluid is injected, resulting in the creation of the endonucleus. We then introduce some viscoelastic into the anterior chamber and we are now ready to perform the nucleus disassembly. With the machine parameters set with the low-flow settings, the phaco probe and the Sinsky hook are now introduced into the anterior chamber. For a cataract that's rather soft, the technique that I prefer and I do usually follow is one wherein I impale into the endonucleus with the phaco probe and lift it out of the bag. The reason that I do so is because I think that if I bring the endonucleus out of the bag and then downsize and emulsify it, the amount of lateral separation forces that the bag has to encounter would be much less and I believe that in this manner I am able to protect the posterior capsule even more. Next we move to the epinucleus removal. In this case I plan to go in and aspirate the epinucleus directly from within the capsular bag. Having an oval rexus gives me more room for the epinucleus to prolapse out with more ease into the anterior chamber, thereby facilitating its easy removal. Let's now watch the rest of the epinucleus removal. I'd like you to watch the ease with which the epinucleus is prolapsed out of the capsular bag. Having an oval rexus makes this maneuver a lot easier. With this, we complete the epinucleus removal. Now prior to bringing the phaco probe out of the eye, I perform a viscofluid exchange to maintain the anterior chamber. We then proceed to performing the bimanual irrigation aspiration to remove the cortex. Remember that we've not created a hydrodissection wave here at all. Now absence of hydrodissection can make the cortex sometimes a little challenging to remove. So having an oval rexus might perhaps enable us to get the cortex out with even more ease. Following the removal of one half of the cortex, a viscofluid exchange is performed once again prior to removal of the second half of the cortex. Once more, we perform a viscofluid exchange at the end of irrigation aspiration. We are now ready to inject the single piece monofocal IOL within the capsular bag. Other than the fact that you should not have major maneuverability within the capsular bag, 
the implantation of the IUL in a case of Perler cataract is not very different from any other cataract. Finally, the IUL is rotated to achieve a horizontal orientation of its haptics. There's two things I'd like you to note now. With the IUL in the back, note the horizontal diameter of the Rex is. It's glaringly obvious that even if we had to put a three-piece IUL in the ciliary sulcus, there's adequate support provided by this oval Rex is. The other point that I'd like you to note, that even though we have created an oval Rex is, the vertical diameter covers the optic edge both superiorly and inferiorly. And for all the reasons that I've demonstrated in this particular patient with the polar cataract, I believe an oval rexis is definitely going to aid your ease of operating a patient with a posterior polar cataract and significantly reduce the pressure onto the posterior capsule, thereby reducing your chances of creating an intraoperative PCR in these polar cataracts. Following the removal of the excess viscoelastic, the wounds are hydrated, thereby bringing us to the end of this particular surgery. I do hope you found this video tutorial useful. Thank you.